Hi, I am Seth Grover. I am the maintainer of Malcolm, the network traffic analysis tool suite. Um, network traffic analysis is all about getting to the important stuff as quickly as possible. There's a lot of open source and proprietary tools out there for analyzing raw packet capture or PCAP files. Uh, Wireshark, Network Miner, Grass Marlin. Um, but analyzing PCAP sets that are large or from complex networks uh, with many tools is difficult uh, because often um, tools that handle raw PCAP data uh, struggle to handle packet capture files that are you know large, larger than maybe a few hundred megabytes or, or gigabyte or two depending on your system resources. Um, so today we're going to talk about Malcolm, uh, a tool that was developed and is developed at the Idaho National Lab with the support of the United States Department of Homeland Security, CISA. You may be familiar with some or all of the tools that make up Malcolm uh, because they're open source and they're all generally in use uh, in, the, in the security and network traffic analysis community. Uh, but what Malcolm provides is a, a framework of interconnectivity for these tools, uh, which, which streamlines network traffic analysis and helps you bring all that important stuff to the foreground uh, as painlessly as possible. So that's what we're going to talk about today in this video is, is using Malcolm to gain insight into both link layer and application layer network traffic. Uh, before we jump into our discussion about Malcolm and some of its primary components like Zeek and the Elastic Stack and Archimy, uh, let's take a minute and talk about um, intrusion detection systems so we can get an understanding of what these tools do and how they fit into the threat detection landscape. When talking about intrusion detection systems, usually you're going to be talking about tools in one of two categories. Uh, host intrusion detection systems, or HIDs, uh, utilize a native agent that runs locally on individual hosts and endpoints on the network. And these agents monitor, you know, not only ma maybe network traffic and uh, stuff at the device NIC level, but also track modifications to system files or monitor user authentication events, configuration changes, and, and report these events to a central manager for alerting and reporting. Um, but host intrusion detection systems is not what we're going to be talking about today, as it's not really the main focus of Malcolm. There are plugins that you can use to get host data into Malcolm, and maybe at some future point we'll put together a, uh, a video that'll, that'll instruct you how to do that. Um, but for now, uh, we're going to be talking about the other category of IDS, which is Network Intrusion Detection Systems, or NIDS. Network Intrusion Detection Systems are generally passive and out-of-band programs or devices that capture and analyze network traffic at strategic points in your network um, in order to monitor traffic among devices in the network or between devices on the network and the outside world. So um, a couple of different ways that we can do this. The monitoring and analysis can be done concurrently. In other words, analyzing the traffic and forwarding it along, uh, sorry, capturing the traffic and then forwarding it along for analysis as it's captured. Or um, the other way is the network traffic can be analyzed uh, after it's been captured in the past, right? Uh, we can capture it first with, with whatever set of tools we want. Um, Matt, we're going to talk mostly about the latter today. Uh, just for our examples, I'll be importing PCAP data and then analyzing that PCAP data uh, rather than using a live network sensor to capture and forward that data. Um, the Malcolm project does include a, uh, a Linux distribution called Hedgehog Linux that's kind of a stripped down Debian based Linux that has these um, capture tools and, and easy configuration for those capture tools to set them up and capture and, and forward to Malcolm. Um, there's another one of the videos uh, on the Malcolm Network Traffic Analysis YouTube channel that talks about how to set up Hedgehog and Malcolm and set up that forwarding together. But today we're going to talk about um, more of the, I've already captured, I've got some PCAP and I want to upload and analyze it with Malcolm. Um, one other good important point about IDS is it's generally passive, meaning that it shouldn't alter the network traffic itself as a side effect of its analysis. Um, there are systems out there that actively drop suspicious network traffic, and those are called intrusion prevention systems, or IPS, instead of intrusion detection systems, or IDS. Um, and it's important particularly in networks with uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, one of the focuses of Malcolm is uh, industrial control systems or, or critical infrastructure networks with uh, OT protocols. Um, while it's perfectly suitable for using in a purely IT network, that's fine. Um, 
but particularly on OT networks, it's important that we don't go knocking things over uh, as far as network services go because because that may be critical infrastructure, right? Uh, and so it's important that IDS is done out of band and and uh, in a way that won't influence the network traffic itself. Um, so let's talk about some of the different approaches to IDS. Uh, each has its, its strengths and weaknesses, I guess you could say. Um, first, there's signature-based uh, detection. And this is what you're familiar to in the context of like a, a antivirus. Um, an antivirus program, you know, it has or, or a malware program that recognizes malware based on some pattern or signature uh, in the malware itself. And then, you know, it has a list of predefined patterns that it's looking for. And when it finds a file or traffic or whatever that matches one of those patterns, um, it, it flags an alert as, as malicious behavior. Um, while signature-based IDS is great for known attacks, and it's usually efficient as far as resource utilization goes, um, it's not generally effective at detecting novel attacks um, because it's like the, the new attacks, the zero days or whatever you want to call them, they're the unknown unknowns, and you, you can't write a signature for something that you don't know about generally. Um, the, the second camp there for IDS is statistical anomaly-based detection. Um, this is, this is uh, the machine learning, right? Machine learning is um, either math cleverly disguised as magic or magic cleverly disguised as math. I'm not exactly sure which. It's cool, um, but uh, the basic idea is that it's creating a baseline for trusted network behavior, and then it will compare new behavior against that baseline um, using this magic or math and uh, this technique can be detect can be effective in detecting anomalies or um, you know novel attacks things that you're not necessarily looking for but uh, you have to it can suffer from high false positive rates especially if you don't have the um, the baseline there to to really define what is normal which can be difficult in a network assessment particularly if you're coming in from the point of view of like I don't necessarily maybe have this long-term um, this long-term network traffic I want to analyze. I just have some PCAPs or whatever, right? Um, uh, it can be computationally expensive as well, uh, as far as resources for the um, the uh, anomaly, the machine learning kind of anomaly stuff. Um, certainly has its place in the threat detection landscape, and uh, there are tools built into Malcolm. Uh, ones we won't really be talking about today necessarily, but um, maybe in a future video we'll do one for that as well, where we can set up anomaly detectors and uh, and start to get that baseline established. But um, today we'll be talking more about I think the third camp, which is where um, I feel is is a nice kind of blend of of knowing what I'm looking for versus trying to flag interesting things that I might not be looking for. And that is stateful protocol anal analysis. Um, stateful protocol analysis based detection uses knowledge of network protocols to look for deviations from profiles of generally accepted definitions of normal activity. In other words, you know, I know what normal HTT tra HTTP traffic normally looks like. It, you know, usually I see these error codes and these kinds of requests, or you know, I know what um, SMB file shares do most of the time, and so if I can kind of categorize based on my knowledge of that network protocol, um, we can uh, programs can then say, hey, you know, here's a summary of what we're doing in this particular protocol or that particular protocol, and it helps us recognize patterns as we look at that data. Um, so what type of intrusions or attacks might we hope to uncover using an intrusion detection system? Uh, let's talk about that. A scanning attack first. A scanning attack is used to um, detect network top topology, to assimilate information about a system or a network being attacked. Uh, by attempting connections to a range of IP addresses within a network or scanning for open ports, uh, which would correspond to, corresponding, uh, to responding services on those hosts, an attacker puts together a map of the topology of your network, the types of network traffic that are allowed through a firewall, what active hosts are on the network, the operating system, kernel, and software versions running uh, on the exposed services. This information can then be used to launch attacks aimed uh, at, at specific vulnerabilities with specific exploits. And, and a good IDS should be able to notice these kinds 
of attacks, these kinds of accesses, because they might possibly be seen as a series of sequential connections from one host to a range of IP addresses or ports, or you know, a, a brute force attempt to to log on to some exposed service, um, and then you know can alert on that host scan or that po port scan that took place. A denial of service attack uh, works by flooding a network or a host with uh, an overwhelming number of connections or requests. So this could be something as simple as sending a large number of ping packets, which is like a ping flood, or by forging the initiation of a TCP connection, a SYN flood, causing the host to be um, unable to respond to legitimate connections. Intrusion detection systems are usually good at categorizing traffic uh, from or to a particular host or service and so um, can often track things like connection state for various network protocols or at least you know the number of connections and attempts which makes identifying a denial of service attack pretty easy um, it's pretty it's pretty obvious I guess when it's happening that that your network is overwhelmed or your host is overwhelmed um, just based on the pure volume uh, and then finally, a penetration attack. This is uh, any type of attack which gives an unauthorized attacker the ability to actually access system resources, privileges, or data by exploiting uh, a misconfigured system or a software flaw. These types of attacks are more difficult to identify because often they, they look like legitimate traffic, right? Or they may be exploiting, like I said, a misconfiguration or, or some unknown loophole uh, to get in and get a foothold in the system. Um, and so it's at that point, once they get a foothold in the system and can maybe pivot to another area in the system, uh, it's easier for them to cover their tracks for future communications and mask their commands as normal network traffic. So um, this is particularly true with custom targeted zero day exploits or uh, exploits for which the attack vector was not previously known. Um, and hence there's not signatures to detect them. Uh, however, IDSs can still be valuable in identifying penetration attacks when they are protocol aware, allowing analysts to recognize changes in patterns of behavior or unusual operations in the context of those protocols within normal network traffic. So um, Zeek, we're gonna talk about Zeek for a little bit. Zeek, which was formerly known as Bro, uh, is one of the two PCAP analyzing engines used by Malcolm to generate metadata about network traffic, which metadata is indexed and made searchable through Malcolm's visualization tools. So uh, before we get into what those tools are, let's do a little more laying the groundwork of what Zeek's capabilities are and what Zeek is to better understand what it offers uh, analysts as a Malcolm data source. So where does Zeek come into the picture? What is Zeek? Um, sometimes it's referred to as Zeek IDS, uh, and it incorporates some techniques from the previous slide, uh, but Zeek is more than just a um, intrusion detection system, really. It's, it's, it's really great. Uh, it's an extensible, open source, passive network analysis framework. And uh, it, it does packet capture, traffic inspection, intrusion detection, uh, records flow logs. It can even be used uh, as a, a robust scripting and data structure framework for log enrichments or for uh, writing your own, you know, creating your own logs or even writing your own network analyzers. Um, so if I had to categorize Zeek into one of the three detection method categories from, from uh, our previous slide, I'd categorize it in the um, stateful protocol analysis detection camp. Zeek's network traffic parsers examine network traffic at the application layer and then reports on the behaviors of hosts that are communicating over those protocols. So these logs can then be used to do a more in-depth uh, manual or automated analysis as we'll see throughout um, our discussion of Malcolm today. I would say that Zeek as well is fundamentally different from other IDSs in that it goes beyond pure signature matching in favor of, uh, of analyzing that application layer behavior of the hosts themselves. Uh, although it does have signature matching capabilities similar to uh, Yara or Snort, um, generally it's focused as more on just uh, parsing network traffic at the application layer. Um, Zeek features can be combined with uh, combined in powerful ways to provide insight into network traffic. Um, with Zeek logs and network analysis 
uh, can include content extraction, for example, uh, extracting uh, exfiltrated files from PCAPs for further examination, um, behavior analysis, and session correlation. As Zeek is, is highly stateful, extensively tracking application layer network state, it can be used to determine what else took place during a session or during the communication between two hosts or, or maybe what preceded or followed a suspicious event. And then, like I said, Zeek is extensible. Uh, support for uncommon protocols, for example, OT protocols, can be added via scripts and plugin architecture. Um, as, as I work a lot with analysts that deal, as I said earlier, in industrial control systems or um, critical infrastructure kinds of networks, a lot of these protocols are not commonly seen you know, on the internet as a whole. And so a lot of the times off the shelf tools that you'll find for dealing with, um, don't include dealing with this kind of traffic. And so um, one of the things that Malcolm has done with its use of Zeek is, is add a bunch more support for uh, OT protocols, for ICS protocols, and, uh, and then allowing us to kind of bring that metadata that's associated with those communications to the forefront uh, alongside the you know more common IT protocols. So Zeek uh, is a really powerful tool. It's commonly used in network traffic analysis, but it does you know have its own set of hurdles. Uh, and in a minute, we'll we'll hopefully see how Malcolm um, you'll hopefully see how Malcolm helps overcome those hurdles. Uh, while Zeek, um, for example, you know Zeek is going to give us that metadata, but uh, it can be difficult for for someone who is not you know, a, an expert traffic uh, analyst, uh, an expert network analyst to get back from the Zeek data to the original packet payload. Um, and, and you know, if you do need to get into the, to the actual low level payload, um, it, it, it can be difficult to like go from Zeek to say Wireshark and open that up um, with just the, the tools that you might be used to using. Um, the, one of the other things, right, Zeek, it, it generates a bunch of flat text log files, right? A bunch of delimited or JSON log files, and if you've got gigabytes of text files, um, there, you know, there are some tools to to manipulate those and stuff. But again, if you're not um, maybe a, a really well versed on the command line, or um, if you don't already have a, a tool set in place to process those text files, it can be difficult to to run Zeek and then know what am I supposed to do with all of this, uh, the, all of this logs, all of these logs. Um, so uh, we're going to talk today about Zeek mostly in its context as a component of Malcolm <coughs> to perform post-capture network analysis against PCAP files that we've uh, already ga gathered previously. Um, so uh, let's talk about the kinds of logs that Zeek generates so that when we get to looking at that data, we can recognize what, what we're seeing. Um, first, uh, the kind of the backbone of Zeek traffic analysis is con.log. Um, con stands for connection, and it's that's what it is. It's network session tracking. Um, con.log is the backbone of, of a Zeek analysis, uh, of a Zeek analysis, because each line of con.log, each record in con.log represents a unique network session, which is identified by a fortuple consisting of uh, originating or source, you can kind of think of it like that, uh, source or originating IP and port and responding or destination IP and port. So um, originating IP port, destination IP and port makes up that four tuple that is a unique identifier for that session. So each connection in con.log, each session, is assigned a, a randomish 18 character unique identifier or UID. And so a particular session's UID from con.log will be referenced in any other Zeek log files generated from that same network traffic. So for example, in the case of a, uh, an HTTP session between a web browser and a website, there may be one line representing the entire session in con.log because that HTTP session is, is a TCP connection and it's from an IP and a port to an IP and a port and then during the course of that connection, uh, there could be many HTTP operations, gets and posts and responses and requests, and each of those uh, 
actions in the HTTP section, each of those operations will be represented in HTTP.log. So you may have one line in con.log with this UID, and then that UID will tie to many lines in HTTP.log because those requests belong to the same session. And so you can use that con.log UID, that Zeek UID, to, to find out like what happened across all of my network traffic in the context of this session. So there are a lot also besides con.log of protocol specific log files that Zeek will generate. Um, so taking note of which log files are generated from a network trace can, can give you insight into what's um, in your network even before you begin analyzing the file's contents. For example, if I see an ssh.log in a network maybe where I wasn't, I didn't know I had SSH going on or something like that, right? That can, that can be like, hey, I better go look at that because I don't, I don't know what that is. And so um, even just starting at like, what log files do I have? What did Zeek generate today on this PCAP? Can give you a good idea of, of just what traffic is in your network. Um, Zeek has a really powerful file analysis engine that attempts to detect and identify when file transfers occur. So um, in other words, any time a file is transferred across one of the protocols that Zeek can understand, uh, Zeek can recognize, hey, this is a file transfer. This is a file being uploaded or downloaded across your network using you know, HTTP or FTP or SMB or IRC or uh, SMTP email. Uh, there's various different protocols that are supported in Zeek's um, file analysis engine. Uh, similar to connections, each file in files.log is assigned a random file unique identifier or FUID that can be referenced in other log files. So very similar to our previous example, a file is transferred by uh, an HTTP request and response and um, that file will generate a line in files.log with a unique FUID and then um, that could be referenced in the HTTP.log to see the details of that connection, right? So use that UID just in the same way that you use the UID in con.log to reference the session across the entire uh, analysis data set. Use that files.log FUID to reference that file transfer across the um, various different protocols that it may have been involved in. Uh, entries in files.log can also be linked to the sessions during which they were transferred in con.log by the connection UID. So this, these two file fields, that con.uid and that files.fuid uh, can be really, really important for getting context about what's going on in a network session. Um, two specific types of files uh, that Zeek breaks out into their own log files is uh, PE.log, PE stands for Portable Executable, and this contains entries about uh, file transfers that were done for portable executable files, or in other words, you know, a Windows.exe or a Linux ELF file. Um, that might be specifically of interest as a network uh, security analyst because oftentimes, you know, you may be like, hey, you know, you we're not supposed to be downloading executable files or whatever and running them on our on these systems, on these endpoints. Um, there's also x509.log, which contains information about uh, x509 formatted uh, public key signatures uh, or public key certificates like you would see in an SSL uh, or TLS um, session. Um, one really important log file for Zeek and, and almost kind of where I would start if I was going to look at a Zeek log uh, a collection of Zeek logs would be notice.log. Um, notice.log is Zeek's concept of an alarm, a big red flag, a way to draw extra attention to an event. So notices can be um, generated from any other Zeek script or protocol as it's processing traffic. Um, Zeek currently implements, I think, maybe 50 or so notices kind of in its default configuration. And then Malcolm adds several more, uh, ranging from um, you know brute force SSH login attempts to SQL injection attacks to expired SSL certificates. And then some of the ones that Malcolm adds for um, recent CVEs that, that you may be aware of or uh, have heard of in the, in the news in the last couple of years, um, events that are uh, categorized according to the MITRE ATT&CK framework, um, so when you see the presence of a notice.log, you know, go, we'll go check that out and say, 
what's going on here that, that Zeke thinks it needs to raise this red flag that I that I should look at this traffic. And we'll give some examples of those as we get into the um, the demo kinds of stuff here, which uh, my plan is to sprinkle throughout this video. So as you're watching this video on YouTube or uh, if, you know wherever you got it, um, that's that's kind of my plan is there'll be there'll be some demo stuff in here as well. Uh, weird.log. Weird is um, a good place to begin when looking for anomalous network traffic from the point of view of anomalous um, in that the protocol itself is not being is not behaving the way that you expect it to. Um, you can kind of some people kind of look at weird as like a notice.log light, like stuff that's kind of strange or maybe not you know a little bit out of the ordinary um, but uh, it, it could be you know it might be nothing um, and so you know it's something to look into but also you need to understand your network in order to um, you know to maybe f weed out some of the false positives or things that you uh, you know actually do expect to see in your network for example you know what because what's weird in one network might be perfectly normal in another um, for example, in, a, in some networks that I've been in and seen where um, old serial protocols are being encapsulated over Ethernet, um, that, that may be very common in uh, a, an aging industrial control systems network uh, that's using, you know, um, serial Modbus or something like that. Um, and then you would see from Zeek a weird dot log that's like, hey, I've got non uh, IP traffic over Ethernet. Um, and I look at that in an OT network and I'm like, yeah, you know, this is pretty much what I expect. That's not really that weird, but in maybe in your IT network or in your, your corporate side of your network, um, that would be unusual, right? So, uh, I don't know, one man's trash is another man's treasure or whatever. Um, but you just kind of need to get familiar with your network enough to know really what is weird and what's not. Um, signatures.log, uh, is used to flag hits from Zeke's signature based engine and is also used by Malcolm to log hits from file scanning engines on transferred files extracted by Zeek. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, and then this one, uh, we won't spend a ton of time on this, but um, at a configurable interval, uh, defaulting to one day, Zeek will dump summary lists of various entities, endpoints, services, whatever, that it's seen over the course of that period. So that might include SSL certificates, MAC addresses, um, hosts that have performed TCP handshakes, Modbus servers and clients, and TCP, uh, I already said TCP services, but um, yeah, like, a, you know, what services, what servers are on your network. Um, known host.log along with con.log can be a, an essential part of Zeek for building a network diagram or from, from validating an asset uh, inventory list. Uh, Zeek may also generate a software log, software.log, where it can identify software communicating um, across the network, client, server, you know, and, and possible, if possible, include the actual version of that software. So examples might include identifying Windows operating system versions and clients and servers uh, communicating over HTTP, FTP, SSH, SMTP, MySQL. Um, and this can be useful during an assessment to identify network hosts or devices that are running software or firmware with known vulnerabilities and uh, or, or software that's out of date, right, that, that hasn't been patched. Uh, and when identifying servers by operating system, type of application running, and, and you know, like I said, the version of that software. Um, so we've talked a little bit about Zeek now. Let's talk about Archimy. Archimy is the other PCAP analyzer used to populate Malcolm's network session metadata database. Um, so Archimy has a lot of similarities to Zeek in, um, in that it parses network traffic data and, and generates these, these sessions, these, these logs um, that represent network connections. These Archimy session logs are written into an Elasticsearch database where they are indexed and they become searchable. Um, what's unique and powerful about Archimy is that these network sessions then can be tied back into um, that original payload that exists in that PCAP file. 
So that allows for deeper packet inspection and searching that's not just limited to packet headers. So um, that's kind of the, the list of components that put together that are put together to make Malcolm uh, at least the main ones. Um, the components comprising Malcolm are, are industry standard open source tools, and uh, that makes it easy to integrate Malcolm with other solutions in those tools' respective ecosystems, whether that be importing more Z plugins or, or dashboards into Kibana or whatever it happens to be. Um, I've got a list here of the network traffic, uh, network application protocols that Malcolm can, can parse, interpret. Um, and, and there's dozens of them there, as you can see, including several protocols commonly seen in OT networks. Uh, much of Malcolm's development right now is dedicated towards improving Malcolm's coverage of protocols used by ICS devices. Um, so let's kind of talk about the, uh, the journey that your PCAP file will take as it uh, is on its way to being enriched and indexed and, and user searchable. Um, upon upload, Malcolm generates the metadata for um, the network traffic that was represented by that PCAP file using both Zeek and Archimedes Moloch capture. Um, and so that PCAP gets sent two directions. Um, Moloch capture aggregates its metadata for particular network connections and it, it aggregates that into a session record which is then written into Elasticsearch for us to, to index. Um, Zeek, as well as we've talked about, generates these log files that are broken out primarily by application protocol, and they similarly contain uh, metadata that that is you know quite that is not unlike that done by Moloch Capture. Um, Malcolm also uses Zeek's ability to carve out files transferred over these protocols, and these files can be scanned, for example, by an antivirus tool or or preserved for analysis um, with you know, with other tools, with whatever your, your tool of choice is. So those Zeek logs are forwarded by FileBeat to Logstash for further enrichment. And it's normalized to the same underlying database schema, the underlying the same underlying field schema that Archimedes uses. So that those Zeek, as much as possible, those Zeek logs and those Archimedes sessions can be viewed side by side as, as apples and apples. Uh, and then that's indexed into Elasticsearch as well. And then once ingested by Elasticsearch, Malcolm provides two interfaces for visualizing that network traffic. Kibana, uh, primarily for the Zeek logs, and then Archimy Viewer, which can be used to visualize the Zeek logs as well as the Archimy session data. So now that we have had a kind of an overview of the main components of Malcolm and how they fit together and, and kind of the theory behind what they do, uh, let's get into the process of actually um, doing network traffic analysis. And and that, uh, surprisingly enough, that doesn't start with just uploading your PCAP file. You would think that would be the first step. But um, there's actually one very useful step that we want to do first as much as possible, uh, and that is to identify network hosts and subnets. So um, for that, there's an interface that Malcolm provides uh, called the host and network segment name mapping interface. And that allows you to assign names for network segments or, or subnets and a host, and that might be any kind of endpoint, whether that's a, a, a server or a desktop or a laptop or a PLC or an HMI or um, you know whatever whatever has IP addresses or MAC addresses on your network. Uh, as Zeek logs are processed into Malcolm's Elasticsearch instance, the logs source and destination IP and MAC address fields, which is Zeek.orig underscore H. And that's that naming convention. We kind of hinted at it earlier, but that originating host, that's orig underscore h. Zeek.resp underscore h, that's responding host. And then uh, the MAC address fields, orig underscore l2 underscore adder and resp underscore l2 underscore adder. Uh, so basically, you know, source IP, uh, dest IP, source MAC, and dest MAC. They're compared against the lists of the host addresses provided in this interface. And uh, when a match is found, a new field is added to the log. It's zeek.orig underscore hostname or zeek.resp responding underscore host name. Uh, so that orig underscore hostname and the resp underscore hostname 
is added to allow your custom defined host name that you've you know mapped out to these IP addresses or MAC addresses to be um, to be actually written along with those logs. Um, for traffic matching the list of segment addresses provided, Zeek dot underscore segment and Zeek dot resp underscore segment fields are added. Uh, if both Zeek dot underscore segment and Zeek dot resp underscore segment are added to a log, and if they contain different values, different subnets, then uh, a tag, a value to the tags field will be added with the cross segment value. And that allows you to conveniently identify cross segment traffic. So at this, you know, maybe right now you're like, my eyes are glazing over what is this resp underscore orig underscore l2. Um, it's, it's really, it's not that complicated. It's just a way for you to say, hey, here's some IP addresses. I want to give them names that I recognize. Here's some network subnets. I want to give them names that I recognize, right? This is my, uh, this is my corporate zone. This is my OT zone. This is my DMZ, whatever. Um, and then if you can identify what those are ahead of time, upon ingestion of that traffic, we'll just, Malcolm will tag that traffic as such, and then note when things like cross traffic, uh, cross segment traffic is happening, right? If you had a device in your um, control systems network that is, that is talking to, reaching out to the internet, or talking to a device in your corporate network, uh, you know, it would ideally flag that as cross segment traffic, and you would be able to, to recognize that. Uh, without having to go hunt it down yourself. Um, there's a field in this uh, in this interface called the required tag field. And basically what that is, is it's a way for you to say only apply this tag or only apply this name, this segment or host name, if this tag exists. As we get into uploading PCAP files in a minute, we'll talk about how you can apply tags that go along with your uploaded PCAP data. So in other words, um, if, if, for example, I'm uh, uploading a PCAP that's represented by a particular representative of a particular um, facility, and that facility's name is, you know, facility ABC, um, I could tag that upload with facility ABC, and then in this um, network segment name mapping interface, basically say only apply this name to this IP address if the tag facility ABC is present. Um, these mappings can also be defined as uh, in a delimited format in cider-map.txt and host-map.txt in the Malcolm installation directory. I would refer you to the Malcolm documentation on GitHub to see the format for that. I hope to be able to come up with a feature uh, in the future where like you could take an Excel spreadsheet or something similar and um, upload it straight into this interface and have it magically figure stuff out for you. Uh, it's not quite there at this point, but um, that's, that's something that maybe we can look at doing in the future. So we're going to go ahead and do our host and network segment mapping now. Um, and I'm going to do that by navigating on the uh, Malcolm web interface to my uh, Malcolm instance is running on localhost and the name map UI is the interface that I'm interested in. And since I was previously authenticated before I started recording this, I, uh, I didn't have to put in my username and password. Now, if I was going to start doing this from scratch, um, you know, depending on how big my network is, uh, I'd either just start typing IP addresses in, you know, one at a time, something like this, um, then click save, or maybe another segment, home network, and we're going to call, oops, 1216.0.0 slash 12 or something like that. Um, and, you know, this is home network, etc. Uh, in this case, for our example, I've uh, already created a network mapping for the PCAP that I'll be using for our, um, for this demonstration. So uh, if you've done that before, you can actually save that and back that up and then restore it later, which is what I'll be doing now. So I'm going to click import. And I'm going to replace the name mappings with this netmap.json file that I previously created that already corresponds to this PCAP. Uh, I'm going to do that, and you'll see that it uh, populates my list here with segments and hosts that, uh, that make up my network map. Um, as you're doing these, you can also uh, you can search the list. For example, if you want to come back later and look up you know, what, you, what you created as your um, 
you want your list of you know historians or something like that I can start typing historian here and it'll filter that list or um, just any text that's available here you know we can start typing that and then it will filter that list but once we've defined our host and network uh, name mappings we're gonna go down to the bottom of this list we're gonna click save and click yes to save our name mappings and then what we're going to do is before that uh, will take effect into our name ingestion into our PCAP ingestion excuse me uh, we will need to click restart log stash and it will tell us uh, make sure that we actually want to do that want to apply the save name mappings and restart log stash and if we do that uh, it says log stash ingestion is restarting in the background log ingestion will be resumed in a few minutes and I can click OK and uh, and at this point after I wait a couple of minutes and wait for log stash to come back up we will be able to um, to continue with our upload and make sure that those IP addresses are mapped to the names that we have specified here once we've defined our network uh, subnets and host names um, we're ready to upload that PCAP data um, it, it Elasticsearch is a, is a write once read many kind of mentality as of, a, of a storage um, platform and so we, we can't upload PCAP data and then go back after the fact and apply those network and host names uh, we need to um, we need to have that ahead of time so that we can enrich that data as we're doing it and so if you come up later and you say oh, I didn't do my network hosts or whatever um, it's not like a huge deal uh, Malcolm generally is pretty quick to analyze network traffic and so you know what I would do is is wipe that data out uh, clear the database for Malcolm and then you know apply my network subnets and host names and just re-ingest the data is kind of the workflow that we generally see um, so so once we've done that Malcolm can be must be provided with network capture uh, network traffic to analyze right in other words a PCAP file um, so we've talked a little bit how that could be done with dedicated network sensors like Hedgehog Linux. Um, oftentimes, though, in an assessment, you'll uh, be given PCAP files that have been previously captured and and you know provided to you as network security analyst or that you have captured at some other point in your network or, or some other point in the past and you're bringing in to analyze now. Um, so PCAP files can be uploaded to Malcolm by processing uh, for processing by accessing the uh, the upload interface so whatever your Malcolm IP address slash upload on the host at which Malcolm is running um, prior to starting the upload as I mentioned you can add tags which will allow the data from the PCAP files uh, being uploaded to be searchable using those tags later on um, there's also some other behavior here on on how the PCAP file is parsed uh, with regards to whether you're analyzing it with Zeek or whether files are being extracted or not generally I like to set these in the um, the configuration options so that they're just done globally and I don't have to mess with them here uh, but if you want to override the global behavior that you've set during configuration with as far as the Zeek and Zeek file extraction goes you can do that here in the upload interface We're going to upload our PCAP file now by navigating to the localhost slash upload and that's going to present us with the Malcolm capture file and log upload uh, log archive upload interface that we that we just discussed um, I have got my PCAP file here and so as it uploads this PCAP file I talked about the tags it's going to apply so um, you know if I wanted to tag this with for example, I'm doing this for a for this uh, training video, so I could create a tag called training, and it would add that. Or if this was a particular site, you know, um, site ABC customer one two three, uh, you know, incident Omega, whatever. Uh, oops, you got the idea. Anyway, I could apply whatever tags I want here, and those tags would be um, searchable after I do the upload. Um, Additionally, Malcolm will take and create tags from the name in the PCAP file itself. So in this case, where the PCAP's file name is cyberville.pcap, uh, the tag cyberville will automatically be applied. Um, so I'm not going to create any additional tags here. I don't really need any besides this default one that I've got uh, from the file name. But I could add as many other PCAP files as I wanted to here if I had multiple PCAP files. 
and uh, and then once I'm done I can either start them individually or just click start upload um, before we we take a harder look at Kibana and Archimedes user interfaces let's talk for a moment about the fields that uh, Logstash can use to enrich log data before it's written into the database so um, in other words there's there's a lot of stuff that we can infer from our network session metadata that might not initially be in that data um, MAC addresses for example MAC addresses can generally be mapped to a hardware vendor as the first three uh, octets of a MAC address uh, are called an OUI or organizationally unique identifier it can be used to distinguish a network card that was manufactured uh, by you know Intel from one manufactured by Dell or you know a VMware network interface or uh, an interface on a, a Schneider PLC or whatever um, this uh, this MAC address then is used to look up that vendor and and that's added into that log whenever possible um, Malcolm also can be configured to do GOIP and uh, ASN lookups for IP addresses. Um, we can identify internal and external traffic based on IP ranges, or in other words, um, you know, private IP ranges versus publicly routable, globally routable IP addresses. Uh, Malcolm can do reverse DNS lookups. It can do um, DNS query and uh, hostname entropy analysis. Uh, in order to detect DGAs or domain generation algorithm host names that are often used by malware so um, some malware will, will use for um, it's a you can go read it on Wikipedia or whatever right look up domain generation algorithms uh, but basically you know the malware generates this long giant uh, host name or, or uh, URL or whatever that that is like a bunch of whole a whole bunch of characters letters and numbers dot a whole bunch of ugly stuff and uh, that high entropy that that randomness in that um, URL host name uh, or that DNS lookup or whatever uh, can be used to uh, can be can be bubbled to the top for your for your analysis um, the other kind of things that we'll do on enrichment with Malcolm is community standard fingerprinting algorithms to be applied uh, whenever applicable so that, that can make Malcolm's data uh, cross-referenceable with other tools. One really good example of that is um, a, a flow hashing technique called Community ID that um, basically takes the the relevant stuff in a network connection, IP addresses and ports uh, primarily, and generates this unique hash of that flow. And then that hash can be used to cross-reference uh, logs from you know, not only inside of Malcolm, Zeke, and Archimy, but you know, off to Suricata or or whatever other network tool uh, that supports community ID, and it's quite a long list. Um, the other one that I would mention, we've already kind of talked about this, is uh, enrichment is done uh, to populate that tags field with each log, um, and some of the tags that I would make particular note of would be these ones that are listed here: the internal source, internal destination external source external destination those are hopefully self um, you know self describing or whatever but uh, to identify traffic that is on a private subnet your 192 dot your 172 dot your uh, sorry your 192 168 dot your 172 dot and your 10 dot uh, IP address ranges versus globally routable IP addresses uh, and then that cross segment one if you've defined your network segments in the um, previous interface that we talked about uh, that cross segment tag will be applied whenever it sees traffic in the Zeke logs that crosses one of those network segment boundaries um, once you've got data into Malcolm it'll take uh, once it's been processed after a few minutes you'll start to see logs trickle in and uh, and you can visualize that log data uh, Kibana is one of Malcolm's two user interfaces for visualizing log data. Uh, where Kibana really shines for me is in providing uh, an intuitive interactive representation of log data that um, that simplifies the process of starting at like this high level and and then being able to drill down quickly to stuff that is interesting to you. So filtering from this big pile of hey and you're looking for the uh, 
the needle in the haystack to like a much smaller pile of hay uh, that makes it easier to find the needle. Um, being able to quickly drill down on a, an individual host or connection of interest. Malcolm comes with dozens of pre-built visualizations specifically for data ingested from, uh, from its Zeek logs. And its dashboards fall into two categories, overview dashboards and protocol specific dashboards. And we'll review some of those here in a minute. Uh, and aside from the pre-built dashboards, uh, Kibana provides an easy drag and drop WYSIWYG editor for creating um, new visualizations on the fly. Now, um, the key to effectively using Kibana is learning how to how to apply filters, how to apply filters, how to how to search the data. Um, so, as as we talk about applying filters, like you know, you'll be using these patterns throughout all all network traffic analysis in Kibana to 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 do what we just talked about, to start from this big picture and drill down into something to zoom in on something of interest. Um, the first step to applying filters is identifying the time range of interest. This can be done by using the time filter controls that are in the upper right hand corner of the interface. If, <laughs> and this is me as much as anyone else I've ever seen, but um, oftentimes if I'm not seeing the traffic that I want to see, and I'm like, where's my data? It's because I'm searching on the wrong time frame, right? It's because I captured my PCAP two weeks ago for analysis and I'm finally getting around to it and like the default controls for Kibana are, are like set for the last 15 minutes or something like that. So always check your time frame in that uh, in those time controls in the upper right hand corner and then you can use that time histogram the, that that like logs over time graph that you'll see on most of the uh, Kibana interfaces most of the dashboards to, to zoom in or zoom out based on uh, what time frame you're interested in. Additionally, the query bar allows you to specify search constraints. And uh, you can do that using a couple of different syntaxes, actually. Uh, the traditional Lucene query syntax um, or uh, the new KQL Kibana query language syntax. And in the documentation and in, in some tables that uh, I'll probably include here in this video, you'll see um, maybe some of the differences in those syntaxes. And, and there's really no magic bullet other than just you know, having the reference bookmarked and uh, and then getting used to what that syntax is for creating your queries. Um, modifying the contents of this search bar uh, and then hitting enter or clicking the search icon to the right of it will run the search and update the results that are displayed. So, um, you know, the uh, time filter, that search query bar, and then finally the filter bar, which is uh, more GUI kind of based filter creator underneath the search bar is the third way of specifying search constraints. Um, although it provides more of a GUI kind of interface to do so, uh, it's generally not quite as like freeform or flexible as, as writing textual queries. Um, in most cases, there's not really a meaningful distinction between putting query terms in the query bar versus the filter bar. Um, what the filter bar does allow you to do, which is nice, is allow you to pin those filters so that when you navigate from one dashboard to another, um, those filters stick around, and the ones in the query bar generally don't. Uh, filter bars are also what's, the filter bar is also what's populated when you click on values in the charts or tables. So um, whenever you see a value in a chart or a table in a Kibana visualization, you mouse over it, there'll be like a little um, magnifying glass with a plus icon or a minus icon in it. Uh, so you can use that to create or exclude filters uh, or create filters for or filters to exclude those values based on um, what you want to see or don't want to see in that result set. And as you click those, inter uh, click those magnifying glasses, you'll see the filter bar is updated to, um, to reflect that filter. I've read that a future release of Kibana will merge the query bar and the filter bar into like one component. I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how they'll do that, but I guess that's something we have to look forward to. Um, let's talk about the overview dashboards. Um, the dashboards under the general section of Malcolm's Kibana interface uh, provide a high level overview of network traffic from across all of the logs generated by Zeek. In other words, they're not restricted to like a particular application protocol. 
Um, these dashboards are a good jumping off point for investigation when you're trying to get a feel for the network and application protocols uh, and, and the hosts that are on that network and using those protocols. Uh, one of note is the notices dashboard. Um, as discussed earlier, Zeek notices are the tool's way of raising some, uh, some event to the forefront of an analyst's attention. Um, and those notices are, are summarized here in the Zeek notices dashboard. Um, the third party Zeek plugins that Malcolm uses uh, to generate additional notices or to, to analyze traffic in different ways can be found in the Malcolm README on the uh, Malcolm's GitHub page. Um, they include some of the interesting ones they include but aren't limited to um, notices that are generated for clear text passwords detected in HTTP POST requests, uh, non-compliant HTTP POST requests, uh, sorry, non-compliant HTTP requests uh, like those that might be used for um, you know, for HTTP smuggling, um, XOR obfuscated file transfers. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but behavior or techniques categorized according to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Um, and then like lots of various other CVEs and vulnerabilities, uh, bad neighbor, call stranger, um, SIG red, zero log on, uh, you know, the ECC certificate validation uh, and the new TLS unencrypted session ticket dissection, um, the eternal family of Samba Windows exploits from uh, SMB v1, uh, which includes eternal blue, eternal synergy, eternal romance, uh, double pulsar, uh, other various SMB exploits, uh, Ripple 20. So the developers of Malcolm uh, endeavor to stay abreast of of developments in the threat landscape and, and whenever possible we release updates that include you know new Zeek plugins to detect uh, or, or scripts to detect these vulnerabilities and exploits as they are discovered. Uh, another interesting dashboard from a security standpoint, uh, a pair of dashboards actually, is the security overview dashboard and the ICS slash IoT security overview dashboards. Um, these highlight events that may be of particular interest from a security standpoint, including Zeek notices, signatures triggered from file scans, clear tracks transmission of passwords, outdated or insecure versions of application protocols, um, traffic originating from or directed to public IP addresses, um, types of files transferred, and more. These, these dashboards can be a good jumping off place. Uh, when looking for indicators of compromise in your network or vulnerabilities uh, in your network traffic. Where possible, Malcolm uh, correlates common fields from across different protocols to allow you to view one device or application's network traffic in the context of the other traffic occurring around it. Um, for example, multiple failed HTTP authentication attempts followed by a successful authenticated HTTP POST operation, followed by, I don't know, uh, sequential reads and writes um, to a file server could indicate that a foothold was obtained in an HTTP server that allowed the adversary to pivot to another service on the network. Um, so a good example of this is the actions and results dashboards, uh, in which actions, a lot of network protocols have the concept of, of action uh, and uh, you know a cause and effect, action and result, um, request and response, whatever you want to call it. And so actions are things such as a file was written, a logon was attempted, a web page was requested, and then the results would be success, access denied, page not found. Um, across all the protocols that, that I can figure out what those actions and results are, I normalize, normalize those to the same fields. So that uh, in, for example, the actions and results dashboard, you can see actions and results across all these different protocols together. Um, in addition to the overview dashboards, Malcolm provides dozens of dashboards tailored specifically to application protocols, uh, including protocols commonly found in uh, industrial control system networks, as well as those found in more traditional IT kinds of networks. The Discover View, Kibana's Discover View, enables you to view events on a record by record basis, uh, similar to a session record in Archimy, which we'll discuss in a moment. Um, 
in other words, the discover view allows you to look at an individual line from a Zeek log, an individual record from a Zeek log. Uh, the data table in the discover view can be customized to display only the fields that are relevant to the traffic that you're interested in. So for example, if I wanted to put together a play-by-play -play of a, an HTTP session, um, rather than looking at this big you know, uh, JSON log that, that contains all of the fields that may not be relevant to my traffic right now, um, I could uh, go to the Discover page, filter on zeek.log type for HTTP, sort by time, and then include source IP, user agent, referrer, dest IP, um, and then the HTTP host, URI, and status message, right? And, and by doing that, I've got a more um, focused view of HTTP traffic that I can then go through and see this happened, and then that, and then this. And then once I've got a configuration that I like for a particular kind of traffic, I can store, I can save that search as you know HTTP traffic analysis or whatever I want to call it, and then return to it for further investigation in the future. The visualizations page allows you to view and manage visualization components which are, are like graphical building blocks to be used in dashboards. Um, Kibana includes lots of different kinds of charts, tables, maps for displaying your data. While Kibana is great for at-a-glance views and for creating custom visualizations, Archimy, which until recently was known as Moloch, provides another interface for examining uh, network traffic that may be better suited to uh, in-depth analysis and network forensics. Um, earlier when we talked about the Malcolm PCAP processing pipeline, we mentioned that that PCAP data um, got sent two directions, right? It got sent to Zeek, and, uh, and then it also got sent down to Moloch Capture, which is Archimedes' program for ingesting that data. Um, while Malcolm's Kibana dashboards are focused on the Zeek logs, and the Archimy sessions won't necessarily be reflected there, um, Malcolm's instance of Archimy can be used to view both Zeek logs and Archimy sessions together in the same interface. Uh, another really great strength of Archimy, and, and uh, I mean arguably its kind of initial reason for existing, is as a, a full PCAP, um, a full PCAP uh, solution, right? Its ability to tie the session metadata back to the original packet's bytes, uh, the original packet payload which allows you to view and search and export the data um, deeper in the PCAP that may not be referenced in the metadata. So Archimy, what it really allows you to do, which I think is um, so, so incredibly powerful, is efficiently deal with very large PCAP file sets uh, and still have access to the underlying payload data, um, something that Wireshark struggles to do. So similar to um, Kibana, uh, we want to learn how to effectively build filters in Archimy um, to, to narrow in on the data that's of interest to us. Um, so we've got uh, at, the, at the top of the Archimy interface, you've got controls for specifying your time filter to define your time search frame, uh, your search time frame. And um, just like in Kibana, that's very important. Make sure you know what the time frame of the data that you're looking at is. Um, there's a a little globe icon that can be clicked to expand a map filter that allows you to uh, restrict results to a geolocation, which may be of interest if you're looking at data that, that is going out to the internet. Uh, there's a query bar where you can specify queries in Archimy syntax. And then um, to the right of the search button, there's this eyeball, uh, this the views button. And that allows you to overlay uh, previously specified filters onto the current sessions filters. And so for convenience, Malcolm provides several uh, Archimy pre-configured views, including some that involve the zeek.log type field, so that in uh, Archimy, as we're viewing both Archimy sessions and zeek logs, you've got a quick way to say, hey, right now I only want to look at Archimy sessions that are tied to PCAP files, or I want to look at zeek logs that uh, were generated from PCAP files but don't leak directly back to the payload like the Archimy sessions do. So um, you can see those here, the uh, some of the views that Malcolm has pre-configured pre for us. Archimy's sessions tab provides a low level details of the sessions being investigated uh, in a way similar to how Kibana's discover interface does it. 
and in the sessions view you will see Archimy sessions that are created from PCAP files and then that Archimy session log is written to the Elasticsearch database and you'll see Zeek logs mapped to that same Archimy session database schema and you'll see those together in the same in the same pane of glass. Um, it, it should be noted that you can distinguish between the two uh, by the value in or the absence of a value in the Zeek log type column in the sessions uh, in the sessions table. Uh, similar to how we did with the discussion to the discover table um, earlier in our discussion, you can also um, customize the set of fields present in the sessions table and then you know save or later recall those configurations of, of fields that you're interested in to exist in that table. As mentioned, Archimy's ability to uh, tie a session record back to its original packet is, is one of its greatest strengths. So details for an individual session or log can be expanded by clicking on that plus icon on the left hand side of the uh, on the left hand side of each row in the sessions table. For Archimy sessions records, uh, an additional packet section will be visible underneath the metadata section. When the details of this section uh, when the details of a session of this type, in other words, an Archimy session, are expanded, Archimy will, will reach out to where the PCAP is stored and um, extract the payload for that session for display here. Various controls can be used to adjust how the packet is displayed. Uh, personally, I like to enable natural decoding and click uh, show images and files. Um, and, and that produces you know, visually appealing results to me for, for when I'm looking at payload data. Uh, but there's lots of options there. Um, other options also become visible when you have uh, PCAP data available, when you have that PCAP session data to be uh, extracted for the payload, and that includes uh, downloading the PCAP itself, downloading and, and generating, carving out, if you will, a, a PCAP for that particular session, um, carving out and downloading or viewing images and files, applying decoding filters, and examining payloads in CyberChef. Uh, all of that can be done from this um, packet payload section. Uh, back up at the top of the interface, um, if you click the down arrow to the far right of the search bar, you'll see some new actions presented there, including PCAP export. Um, when a full PCAP sessions are displayed, the PCAP export feature allows you to generate a new PCAP file from the matching Archimy sessions, including controls for which sessions are included. In other words, open items, only the ones that I've actually got expanded right now, visible items, which is everything that I'm seeing on this page right now, or all matching items, everything matching my current search filters, uh, and then whether or not to include linked segments. Once you've defined how you want to do that, um, what your filters are, and then which uh, sessions you want to include, click the export PCAP button to generate the PCAP, and after which you'll be presented with a, a browser download dialog to save or open that file in Wireshark or whatever it happens to be. Um, note that depending on the scope of your filters, this could take a long time, right, to generate that PCAP file, or it might even time out. So um, it's, it's a good practice to look at the number of matching sessions there on your Archimy Sessions interface before you go exporting a PCAP. And if it's like, hey, you know, this is one billion sessions, I may want to apply further filters before generating that PCAP file um, to, to further narrow my, um, narrow my search. Um, note here as well, and, and this is kind of a known issue that, that I hope to be able to figure out a way to resolve, but um, you will probably get an error if you try to do an export PCAP without applying the PCAP files view with that little eyeball icon to the sessions first. Um, there's there's a bug in what I'm doing, I guess, or, or something that uh, when uh, it tries to export a PCAP file from logs that don't have PCAP associated with it, um, you might get an error. So uh, if, you'll, if you'll apply that PCAP files view first, you'll make sure that that, uh, that error is avoided. Um, moving on from the sessions interface, uh, we're going to go to Archimedes SPY view. SPY stands for Session Profile Information. And the SPY view provides a, a quick and easy to use interface for uh, exploring session or log metrics. 
basically um, what the spy view page does is list categories for general session metrics like protocol source and destination IP addresses source and destination ports uh, and also like all of the various different network protocols that are understood by Archimedes and Zeek. So whether it's HTTP or SNMP or BACnet or whatever, um, these categories can be expanded and the top N values displayed for whatever field of interest uh, exists there, including that field's values cardinality. In other words, it's a, it's a good like top talkers, top N whatever, um, display of, of any field of interest for you in, uh, in Malcolm's logs. And between Archimy and Zeek uh, data sources, Malcolm's list of, um, of fields that are available for you to check out here in the spy view is, is over 1,300 uh, different fields across all these different kinds of network traffic. So click on the plus icon to the right of a category to expand it. Uh, and the values for specific fields are displayed by, by clicking that field's description in the fields list underneath the category name. Um, that list of fields can be filtered by typing part of the field name in the search for fields dialogs to display uh, in this category text input. Um, the, the load all and unload all buttons can be used to, to just like bring forward everything that it knows about that protocol at once, um, but you, you may want to be careful with this as it is going to run a lot of queries and, and it might take a while. So, you know, if, if you know you actually want to see everything, yeah, go ahead and smash that load all button, but um, it, it might, you know, end up giving you more data than you really want depending on, on what your interests are. Uh, once displayed, a field's name or one of its values can be clicked on to provide further actions for filtering or displaying that field or its values. So uh, of a particular interest might be the open field name spy graph option when clicking on a field's name or pivoting to another sessions tab with that field filtered. Um, that'll open a new tab with the, the spy graph populated or the sessions populated with that filter already applied. Um, note that because the SpyView page can potentially run many queries, SpyView limits the search domain to seven days, or in other words, seven indices, as each index represents one day's worth of data in Malcolm. So when using SpyView, basically that means you need to limit your search time frame to less than or equal to seven days before you flip over to this tab, or, or it'll uh, complain at you uh, for doing that. Um, spy graph is is another really cool way to visualize the top n field values of, of a particular um, field both chronologically and geographically um, so spy graph session profile information graph visualizes the occurrence of, of whatever fields values over time uh, and and for me that's particularly useful because it helps me identify trends in a particular type of communication over time. Um, when I'm looking at uh, just kind of the conglomeration of all of the traffic over the date histogram there up at the very top, it's hard, it's hard to pick out patterns for a particular protocol or a particular uh, IP address or user agent. Um, so traffic for example, using protocol as an example, traffic using a particular protocol when seen sparsely at regular intervals on that protocol's date histogram in the spy graph could indicate, you know, a connection check or polling or beaconing. Um, and, and having it split out by protocol, by value like that, uh, is very useful. Um, but it doesn't have to be protocol. It can be any of those 1300 fields that Malcolm knows about. You can set as kind of that pivot value for the spy graph to, uh, to split out those top n values and show you chronologically and geographically where those took place. Um, controls can be found underneath the time bounding controls for selecting that field of interest uh, for the number of elements that you want to be displayed, for the sort order, and for if you want to periodically refresh that data view or not. Uh, one of my favorite ones to play around with is the connections view, um, uh, but also just from being cool, it's, it is very useful. Uh, the connections view presents network communications via a force directed graph. So it makes it easy to visualize logical connections between um, these logical relationships between network hosts or between uh, subnets or between 
you know, again, any fields, uh, any of these 1,300 different data points that we have, uh, you can visualize kind of how the traffic goes between source and destination uh, based on that field's values. Controls are available for specifying the query size. Um, so this, again, can run a lot of queries. And so um, by default, like with the query size set to, to small, which is like 100, I think, is the default, um, you, it'll run faster but you actually may not be getting all of your data, right? Um, so what I like to do is set up my other filters and get everything kind of the way I want it with my, my query size set to small. And then once I've got it all set the way I want it with my filters and my views and like the source and destination nodes set to the fields that I'm interested in, then I will increase the query size uh, to like the max value so I can you know see everything um, that I'm interested in there. Uh, but that will take longer to execute, right? Um, so you can select the query size. You can select which fields to use as the source and destination for node values. You can set a minimum connection uh, threshold. Uh, the method for determining the weight or the thickness of that line between the nodes and, and the size of the nodes themselves. Um, as is the case with pretty much every other visualization in Archimy, that graph is interactive. So by clicking on a node or clicking a link between two nodes, you can, uh, you can apply or modify filters. You can um, reposition the nodes themselves by dragging and dropping them. Um, uh, a node's color indicates whether it's communicated as a, uh, a source or a destination, an originator or responder, or, uh, or both. So while the default is uh, source and destination IP for those fields, um, the connection view is able to use any combination of any of the fields that Archimy knows about. So some that I have found interesting or useful before, um, selecting source OUI and dest OUI to view which um, devices from which hardware manufacturers are speaking to each other. Um, source IP to protocol can be um, a good way of visualizing what hosts are communicating to what servers out there uh, based on the services that they provide. Maybe originating network segment and responding network segment. If we populated our network segments uh, at the very, very beginning before we even created our PCAP file in that define uh, network host and subnet name uh, interface. Um, maybe originating GOIP city and responding GOIP city could be interesting to see where my source and destination traffic is is going out to on the internet. So any of the combination of these or other fields can be used to specify that source node and destination node in the connections view. Another cool recent addition to this feature, uh, and one that actually we developed here uh, at the INL and then contributed um, back upstream to Archimy, uh, was the ability to specify a baseline time frame in the connections view and then visualize, use that baseline to visualize changes to a network over time. In other words, you know, new hosts or protocols that appeared in my network this week that didn't exist last week. Um, this feature is mainly useful if you have prior long-term packet captures available in order to establish that baseline, right? In order to define what my previous time frame is versus what my current time frame is so that you can do that comparison. Another really cool feature of Archimy uh, that allows you to, um, to get access to the payload data and actually search the packets themselves versus just the session metadata is the hunt feature. Um, you can kind of think of this as like a, a PCAP grep. Um, the, the search string that you specify for the hunt filter can be specified with ASCII, uh, with or without case sensitivity, uh, hex codes, regular expressions. Uh, and basically, you, you create this uh, packet search job on the hunt page with the filters and the other parameters that you're interested in to limit that search um, scope uh, to, to make that packet search go a little bit faster. Um, and then once that hunt job is complete, it runs in the background. But once it's complete, it tags matching sessions with that hunt ID. And you can go view the sessions or the matching uh, payloads in the sessions view. Um, so uh, note that whatever filters you specify in the search bar when that um, hunt bar, when that hunt job is created, will also apply to the hunt job as well. So if I'm over on the sessions view and I've got a filter in the query bar and I switch over to the hunt view, those, those filters uh, 
limit the search of packets, the search of the scope of the packets, the, the scope of the search of the packets that I'm looking at in that hunt job. Um, and, and so pay close attention to that. Um, there's a little little like information icon that says creating a new packet search job will search the packets of one million sessions or whatever that number is. Just be aware of what that number is because um, your your search, your hunt's execution time will be directly related to how many packets it needs to go out and look in. Um, note that the hunt view is only available for sessions created from full packet capture data, not Z-Clogs. In other words, Archimy sessions only, not Z-Clogs. Uh, so it's a good idea again here to apply the uh, to click that eyeball icon, click the view eyeball, and uh, select the PCAP files view to exclude Z clogs from your candidate sessions um, prior to using the hunt feature. Uh, a couple of notes uh, on correlating data sources between the Archimy and um, Zeek data sources. Um, Note that because these are different tools developed by different organizations for uh, different purposes, um, the search syntax between Archimy and Kibana is different, right? Malcolm is utilizing both of these open source tools together, but um, you know, in some cases, the in in all cases really, the search syntax will be a little bit different between Archimy and Kibana, and in some cases, the field names themselves will be a little different. So. Um, you know, refer to that documentation, refer to that table that we showed you earlier uh, to, to compare like, how do I write a query that um, searches an IP address based on its presence in a subnet, uh, you know, or for sessions that, that include that subnet, or for how do I do a regular expression or whatever, um, because it won't necessarily be the same in Archimy versus Kibana. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, Archimy uses its own field names in its user interface. For example, in Archimy, you would search protocols equals equals HTTP, but in Kibana, the equivalent search would be protocol colon HTTP. Um, so going to Archimy's help, which is the click on the owl icon in the upper left-hand corner, and then go down to the field section, which is at the bottom of that help page, and click uh, database display, display database fields, can help you map what Archimedes field names are to uh, what the underlying database field names are that the um, that the Zclogs might use. Um, as much as possible during ingestion, we do try to map those Archimy fields to, sorry, the Zclogs to their corresponding Archimy fields. Um, but uh, but it, it might help to know, like, if I'm jumping from Archimy over to Kibana and I want to know what fields it was actually searching when I was in Archimy, you may need to do some manual uh, mental mapping of the Archimy field names to the underlying database field names. Um, also, you know, despite considerable overlap, especially for common protocols, there are differences in protocol parser support between Zeek and Archimy. Notably, Malcolm's configuration of Zeek parses a lot more ICS protocols. Than, uh, than Archimy does, because uh, that's one of the main focuses of this project. So we've looked at these two different interfaces to, uh, to analyze that same underlying, um, the, the session metadata from our network traffic. Um, we've taken this one PCAP, and Archimy has generated its session records, and Zeek has generated its logs, and um, how can we correlate the two? How can we how can we bring them together and and see like this get the strengths of both tools, right? Get the information about the um, protocols and stuff that Archimy maybe doesn't have support for um, from our Zeek logs, but then at the same time be able to see the Archimy sessions that correspond to those uh, events of interest or whatever they are from the Zeek logs, so that we can get down if we want to and see the payload and and do analysis uh, kind of at that level. Um, so as I mentioned just in in the previous topic, like one of the things that z that it, that Malcolm does to try to facilitate this is it maps wherever possible Zeek fields to corresponding Archimy fields in the database schema. Um, but then for any protocols or fields where um, where Archimy doesn't already have native support, Malcolm creates a native uh, database, uh, a native data source type, I guess, for that kind of Zeek log 
for all these other Zclog values for which there's not currently support or an equivalent in Archimede. Um, the fields section of Archimedes Help, which I referenced a few minutes ago, can provide a list of all of those known fields across both the Archimede and the Zeek data sources. So in this way, when full packet capture is an option, um, analysis of PCAP files can be enhanced by the additional information Zeek provides. And why I say when PCAP, uh, full packet capture is an option, um, you know, there may be cases where, for whatever reason, whether it's size constraints or... Um, uh, you know, sensitivity of the information, like you may be able to, to capture Zeek logs, just Zeek logs, and actually not store the full PCAP. So uh, in that case, Malcolm can still be used in both the Archimede and the Kibana interfaces, but when you have the full packet capture available to you, um, you, you are able to, you know, enhance that full packet capture beyond just what the Archimy session is giving you with, with the Zeek logs as well versus the Zeek logs just being alone. Um, the, value, the values of the records that are created from Zeek logs can be expanded and viewed like any native Archimy session by clicking that plus icon to the left of the record in the sessions view just as we showed you uh, when we were talking about the sessions view. Uh, however, note that when, when you deal with those Zeek logs, uh, the Zeek records, the full payload that section on the packet payload it doesn't exist, right? Because the packet contents aren't available. Uh, so the buttons that deal with viewing and exporting PCAP information, like, don't behave the same. They don't do anything, basically, as they would for records with PCAP files. Um, other than that, though, Zeek records and their values are usable in Malcolm just like their native Archimy session counterparts. A few fields of particular mention that help limit returned results to those Zeek logs and Archimede session records generated from the name from the same network connection are community ID and Zeek's connection UID. We've mentioned both of those earlier, and uh, we can talk about how. Uh, let's talk about how we can use those to. Um, to get kind of that full picture, right? So, so the example that we're talking about here is something interesting happened on my network. I want to see in one list everything I know about it. I want to see all of the Zeek logs, and I want to see the Archimede session or Archimede sessions that corresponded it, to it. There, there's kind of a hard way and an easy way to um, to do that. The hard way would be, you know, find the logs that I'm interested in or whatever in Kibana. Or, or however I want to do it, and then like say, okay, I've got this source IP and that desk IP and this port, and it happened at this time, and just kind of try to like handcraft your filters to, to, to include everything you want, but nothing you don't want. And that's difficult to do. But what we can do is um, we can use this Zeek connection uh, UID, Zeek.UID, and that community ID, and we can use that to kind of build a, a query filter that includes everything that has to do with that session across both Zeek logs and Archimy sessions. Community ID is a specification for standard flow hashing published by Corelight. And the intent is to make it easier to pivot from one data set, like Archimy sessions, to another data set, like Zeek con.log entries. Uh, in Malcolm, both Archimy and Zeek populate that community ID value, which makes it possible to filter for a specific network connection and see both data sources results for that connection. Um, that Zeek.UID is also mapped to another Archimy database field called uh, root ID, so you can use Zeek.UID or root ID interchangeably. That root ID field is used by Archimy to link session records together when a particular session has too many packets to be represented by a single session. When normalizing Zeek logs to Archimy's schema, Malcolm kind of piggybacks or hijacks on root ID and stores that uh, connection UID to cross-reference uh, entries across Zeek log types. So um, that, that's interchangeable, Zeek.UID or root ID. So, the, the cool pattern that I want to kind of get across here in this example is by filtering on the community ID ORD with the Zeek UID, so community ID equals equals some horrible long string, or pipe pipe root ID equals equals some different horrible long string that represents the Zeek UID, um, that, will, that will cast this tent which will include both the Archimy sessions and the Zeek logs that are generated by this particular network connection. And you can see them together in one place.
one item that was uh, mentioned earlier, but we didn't really get into the details of how it works, is the uh, Malcolm's ability to analyze files that are carved from network traffic. Um, as I did mention earlier, as I uh, referenced this feature, Zeek can carve files from a variety of protocols uh, in observed network traffic. Um, and then those files can actually be extracted and, and stored temporarily locally by Malcolm for analysis. Uh, Malcolm leverages that feature to submit these carved files to a number of file scanning tools. Uh, ClamEV, for example, which is an open source antivirus engine, uh, can be used to scan for known malware signatures. Yara, uh, the pattern matching Swiss Army knife, um, scans the files using a curated list of security related signatures or your own custom Yara signatures that you can write. Um, Kappa, which is a portable executable capabilities analyzer and uh, VirusTotal, an online database of file hashes. Now to use VirusTotal you do have to specify your uh, API token and you would need to have an internet connection for those um, to be submitted, for those hashes to be looked up. So Malcolm can be configured to, uh, there's a couple different other configurations with the file scanning behavior that you can set. Number one you can set which kinds of files you um, extract and scan to begin with, uh, meaning do I want to scan all files, do I want to scan uh, files that are just of uh, MIME types that may be of particular interest when it comes to uh, security standpoint, right? Um, things like zip files or executable files or PDF files that might be vectors for, for common known attacks. Um, and then in, additionally to which file, in addition to which files we scan, um, we can specify which files we want to preserve, if any. Uh, in other words, do I want to preserve all files and, and then they get stored in this directory locally on the Malcolm instance, or do I want to only preserve files that get hits from the scanning engines uh, that might be flagged as suspicious, uh, or do I not want to preserve files at all? And then um, those files, if they are preserved, can be downloaded from that um, directory where they were preserved, and then you can do whatever further examination you want on them, whether that's submitting them to other file scanners or um, reverse engineering them with with Ghidra or, or Ida Pro or whatever your um, tool of choice is there. As the uh, files are scanned, if Zeek file carving is enabled and those scanners are turned on, questionable files will be written into the signatures log and reported on the signatures dashboard in Kibana. Um, the signatures dashboard will break it down by the scanning engine and then also the name of the signature uh, or rule that triggered on that file. Uh, the Zeek connection UID, Zeek.UID, and file UID, Zeek.FUID, fields in these logs, in the signatures log, can be used to cross-reference to other visualizations to provide the context for how that file was transferred. So in other words, you know, finding on the signatures page a reference to a zeek.fuid for a triggered signature, filtering on that zeek.fuid, and then uh, jumping over to the files.log to see what, what is it about this file that I know, how was it transferred, how big was it, what other dashboards might reference that file, that sort of thing. Um, just a few search tips before, uh, before we close out here. Um, to, to effectively search in Kibana and Archimy, um, number one, always check your search time frame. Uh, if you're not seeing the data you're expecting to see, often it's because the data lies outside of the window of time that you're searching. Um, number two, this effective technique for investigating is, is zoom in. For example, narrow in on a particular type of file that's transferred or a particular host. Once you find something of interest, pivot to another field so select the source IP address that was uh, the source of this file transfer and then zoom back out by removing the file type filter to see what other activity that source IP was involved in. Um, that, that's a very effective way when dealing with a large data set is, is you find some value that's of interest to you, zoom in on that value, see the contextual, the other values in context with that and then zoom back out by filtering on these new values and removing the original filters. 
Um, remember that most elements in Kibana and Archimy are interactive and can be configured to work with any of the more than 1300 data fields that Malcolm knows about. So generally in Archimy and Kibana, if you can click on it, you can, you can create a filter or you can pivot to some other view and, uh, and you don't have to go find these things manually. Uh, you know, don't, don't, Save yourself some work by by learning to create filters from the graphical interface, uh, rather than just having to go remember and oh, what was my query string that I was doing before, and then and then get to it that way. Um, learn how to filter on on common fields like zeek.log type, um, the the source IP dest IP source port dest port protocol field, action and result. Uh, OUI, source OUI and dest OUI, um, these fields that get normalized across all of the different log types that we can do uh, with Zeek. Um, you know, there's, there's, you're, you're not going to memorize all 1300s of the fields that we have uh, that we could populate in Malcolm, but you know, as you start to become familiar with those most common ones, uh, learn to build filters around those fields and you'll become more effective in your searching. Finally, don't forget about that tags field. Um, using pre-populated tags like the ones that we do during enrichment for the private and public IP space, um, the tags that you that got generated when you uploaded your data, um, the tags that got created during the segment mapping stage of enrichment, um, all of these tags, including tags that are populated automatically based on PCAP file name, um, learn to search on those tags, apply filters on the tags field. Um, and you can narrow your, you can, you know, easily narrow to cross-segment traffic with tags equals cross-segment. And it's much harder to do the same thing with source IP in, you know, 192.168.0.0 slash whatever and dest IP in 10 dot whatever dot whatever. Like, yeah, you could do it that way, but it's going to be a lot easier just to use the tag that's already populated for that field. I hope this was a good kind of Malcolm 101 course for really starting to get down and get our hands dirty on um, with PCAP analysis. Uh, I enjoy um, maintaining this project and, and showing people how to use the tool. Um, if you've got feedback for me, uh, reach out on, on GitHub. Uh, reach out via, if you want to, in the YouTube um, comments or, uh, or get in touch with me any other way you can figure out. Uh, and and let me know what you think. Um, we're interested to to know how the community is using the tool and and ways that we could improve it. Um, thank you for your time and uh, happy hunting.